What is up, guys? Welcome back to another special episode of the Fantasy Fellow Show. My name is Kyle. It's August 5th, and hey, like it's week one of the preseason. We have games starting on Thursday night and all across the weekend. So very excited to be here. Uh, we got a lot of train camp news and a lot of things going on right now in the NFL. There might be a Brandon Ayuk trade announced tonight. We'll, uh, we'll get there when that comes. But in this video, we're going to do something uh, a little bit different. I finally got my 32-team projection series done. So now I can get into some more, uh, you know, locked in videos where we're talking stats and data and, and things like that. So uh, we're going to open up my 2024 redraft guide. And it's August. You know, we got a lot of people starting to do prep for their fantasy football leagues. Hopefully you guys don't have a draft yet. Uh, you know, maybe next, you know, maybe this weekend, maybe next weekend. That's when they should start. Uh, for me, my drafts are always on Labor Day weekend. But what we're going to do here is uh, I do have an article that I have listed for free. Again, it's August 5th right now. I'm probably going to make it not free. Maybe this maybe this the Saturday or Sunday, I'll probably turn it back on into the, the members content. But if you guys want access to my members stuff where you get rankings, projections and all kinds of stuff and, and you know, articles like we're going to read today, it's only seven dollars for the month of August. So check it out. We're going to click into my redraft guide here and I'll kind of walk you through. And this is what I'm telling people this year. This is what I've, I've done. Probably 400 best ball drafts, a lot of mock drafts. I love doing the best ball drafts. And a lot of that times I get a really good feel for like who people like in best ball drafts, but the ADP is not the same for a redraft league. So I, I like certain players and certain builds in best ball. Uh, and then I apply this thought to a redraft and it's a lot different. How I draft a best ball is a lot different how I draft a redraft team. So we're going to kind of zoom in here and we're just going to read the article together. It's a long one. So stay buckled in uh, and, and we'll kind of review it just as we go. So the 2024 fantasy football redraft guide, the main idea of the whole thing is to draft a top five player at each position. I think this year is all about balance. You, uh, you don't really want to dabble with zero running back this year. I think you need one of the top five guys, uh, or at least a guy that can be a top five threat, you know, most weeks, uh, obviously receivers are a pretty big deal. And I think quarterback and tight end, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll pull into some of the numbers here, but just when I do these ESPN mock drafts or sleeper or Yahoo, I don't really like the teams that I, I don't have a top 10 running back. I don't like teams where I, I start running back, running back, because then I'm missing a really good receiver. Um, so you want to be balanced at receiver running back, I think, to start your draft. And then we'll talk about when to pull your QBs and your tight ends. And uh, I start off by saying, seems simple enough, but many teams will fail to execute this idea on draft day. Let's break down what each position averaged last year among the top five at their position versus the guys that were 10th, 11th, and 12th. So what we're trying to do here is we're going to see what a top end, a top five player, say, let's say quarterback, a top five quarterback versus a bottom starting quarterback, you know, whether that's 10, 11, or 12. And uh, the top five numbers for a quarterback last year, they averaged... 346 or they you know 346 combined or average points and then the average per game was 21.64 points per game now the bottom qb1 starters averaged about 270 points and they only averaged about 16.85 points per game uh so you know if you're starting a top five quarterback every week you're gaining almost 4.79 points per game over a team that's in the bottom 10 of and 12 for their QB one. So that is pretty significant. Having a top five QB instantly gains you 4.8 points over the bottom three teams. And a lot of teams are, aren't going to be starting a top 10 or 12 quarterback most weeks, but when you start a top five QB, they're more often to score in the top five. And so this number could be even greater. So there you go. You, you gain 4.8 points just by starting a top five QB versus someone that wanted to wait for a top 10, top 12 QB. So um, you know, we'll, we'll get more, in, like I'll break down each position by position as we get further, but I think that is a pretty significant difference, you know? So any week that I'm starting Patrick Mahomes and I'm going up against say, I don't know, Brock Purdy, I, I think I have the advantage there by almost five points, which feels pretty good. Now let's look at the running backs here. A top five PPR running back is going to average about 289 fantasy points. That's 18.05 points per game. Now, a bottom tier starting running back 
RBs 10 through 12, they're going to average about 223 fantasy points, which is just under 14 points per game. That's a difference of about four point about four points per game in a PPR setting. So that top five running back, man, it means a lot. And you know, some teams aren't even going to have a top 10 or 12 running back. So if you have at least one of those guys, you're gaining a nice massive edge there. And then for half PPR, the difference uh, is about 4.11 points per game. So still roughly four points per game that you can average. And, you know, if, if you don't have a top five, top 10 ish running back, man, you're, you're really treading water. So I think zero RB is nice because you can kind of load up and get a bunch of guys. I mean, I like, you know, for zero RB drafters, I mean, I love Jalen Warren, Javante Williams. You know, there's Devin Singletary, Chase Brown. You know, there's a lot of guys in that zero running back range that I like. But for redraft, man, if you're only putting up 10, 12 points per game in a PPR league and you're up. Away. So if you can plug in a guy like Jameer Gibbs, Brees Hall, Bijan. All of a sudden, that matchup only becomes a difference of a couple points. So that, that's where I lean into getting a top five running back threat, at least for this year. Now, at the receiver position, a top five PPR player gets about 20 points per game. And a bottom 10, 11, 12 ranked receiver gets about 15.63. That's a difference of 4.37 points. So again, kind of everything's about four, four and a half point differences when you get a top five player versus a starting you know back end starting wide receiver one running back one quarterback one whatever uh in in half ppr this number is not as big um they go from 16.62 points per game for a top five half ppr receiver and down to 13 points per game for a bottom starting wide receiver which is only about 3.6 difference so uh, a little bit more more trickier in half ppr you could pull off less receivers in a um my bad i think i said that wrong you, you could pull off you know Start with your running back, and then you get your receiver in half PPR. That might be my preference for half PPR this year. And then finishing up with tight ends, uh, a PPR top five tight end averages about 13.42 points per game, and a bottom starting tight end averages only 8.58. So this position, I mean, you want a top five tight end, man. Otherwise, you're missing out on a lot of big points here. Uh, in a full PPR, that's a difference of 4.84 points per game, which was the greatest variance of top five players versus bottom 10 through 12 players. And then half PPR, it's about a difference of 3.69. So uh, just from doing this data study, I, I think half PPR, your first pick needs to be a running back. Unless you're getting CD Lamb or Tyreek Hill or one of the top, top guys at the receiver position. But I think half PPR, your first pick should be a running back this year. I think there's probably five running backs that are worth a half PPR pick first round. At least you can maybe sneak in another player or two, but half PPR, I want one of the top five running backs for sure. And then I can take my swings at receiver later. Um, so I kind of talked a little bit more about this and um, basically just recapped what the numbers we're looking at here. So the plan is simple, drafting a top five caliber player at each position uh, and Again, just doing as many best ball drafts as I do and knowing the values and the players that I like in those formats and then just simply applying that to redraft. Uh, I think I want at least one early running back, preferably in the first two rounds in a full PPR draft. Uh, and you need at least one receiver for the first two rounds. And I think in, in any half PPR, or full PPR format. And then I think the real strategy is the tight ends. What are you going to do at tight end? Because they go a little bit later. You can grab quarterbacks and tight ends starting in the third and fourth round this year, uh, and they're not a part of your first two-round process. So uh, let's get into the quarterbacks, which, again, I think if you go into your draft knowing, yep, I'm drafting only a, a running back and a receiver my first two picks, and then I'll kind of make it uh, round three is where I decide what to do. Um, because the quarterbacks, their ADP starts in the third round, and there's some tight ends going in the third round. And if you want one of the top end guys, the consensus top five is Josh Allen, Jalen Hurts. I think both those guys are in the third round. Mahomes, Lamar, and Richardson here. I'm actually going to pull up. Um, we're going to pull up the ADP that I used to make this uh, ADP comparison here. So if I go to just QB. All right, so you got Josh Allen. This is ESPN's ADP, by the way. They have Josh Allen at pick 28, Mahomes about pick 28, and Jalen Hurts pick 33. So these three quarterbacks are all being drafted in the third round right now. And for me, I say that my favorite way to draft a QB has always been to draft a player outside the consensus top five that I think has a chance of finishing in the top five. 
Uh, last year in my my Superflex League, I was able to hit on Dak Prescott, and not only that, but I hit on Brock Purdy as well. Um, so I like these guys that give me a huge value because when you take Josh Allen as the QB1 off the board, I, to me there's only downside. If Josh Allen doesn't finish as my QB1, I don't think it was a good pick. And, you know, same kind of thing with QB2. I know Jalen Hurts is, is there at QB2. I like Hurts a lot this year. He's actually my QB1 in my projections. So I'm open to pulling on Jalen Hurts. And then I think same thing with Patrick Mahomes. Those guys at least have a pick of, you know, they can finish one, they can finish two. Those guys have a little bit of upside based on where they're going. Uh, but I'm kind of out on Josh Allen just because I, I only see downside. He has to finish as the QB1 for me to like that pick. And uh, by, by waiting on, again, the idea of drafting a, a top five QB that's going outside the consensus top five, this is going to give me a value hit over the teams that drafted a top five QB because – Say you draft Mahomes at QB3 and he only finishes QB3. That, that's a, It's a good pick. He didn't go down at all from his, his finish. But uh, when I draft a Dak Prescott as like the 10th, 11th, 12th QB last year and he finishes as QB3, that means I had a huge hit in that round. And, you know, instead of taking Mahomes round three, I'm taking another wide receiver or running back that can help my team build and give me some tremendous depth versus, you know, where I took Dak Prescott in the seventh, eighth, ninth round, all of a sudden that, that, running back receiver pool is not as great as it was in the third round. So it allows you to stack on early high end RBs and, and receivers. I mean, you could again, I know you can totally draft a QB from the consensus top five. I have no issues with that, but I prefer them to fall to me. If I catch a falling Josh Allen, that's fine. If I catch a, anyone falling in this consensus top five, I think it's fine. Um, but for me, this is the short list of quarterbacks that I think could finish in the top five. Uh, that are not, you know, part of the consensus. It's C.J. Stroud, Kyler Murray, Joe Burrow, Dak Prescott, and Jordan Love. I do want to throw an Anthony Richardson in there as well because on ESPN he is QB six. I think in most best ball formats he's QB five. So it's kind of like a flip flop there. Uh, but I think Anthony Richardson is part of my my short list of QBs. Now on ESPN they have Stroud at QB five and Richardson QB six. So I say perhaps perhaps we can include Richardson in this list to give us six targets from the highlighted list here. Um, and then I note the ADPs here. Um, so Stroud's ADP is 45 and a half on ESPN. If you want CJ Stroud, I get it. I actually think he's my least favorite in the highlighted group that I, that I showed above because he's going to, he's going to offer the least highest rushing upside. All the other quarterbacks run more frequently than CJ Stroud. I think he only ran for a hundred and some yards and maybe a touchdown last year. So he's not a runner. They have Joe Mixon. They have a lot of good receivers. He's going to be awesome and dynamite in the passing column and probably has a chance for 4,500 yards and 30 touchdowns. But uh, again, I, I think if I'm picking anyone here, I, I would pass on Stroud at 45 and a half. If he falls into the fifth, that's where I start to think about him. Now, Richardson at 51 and a half, I know a lot of people are concerned about the risk with his shoulder and his running style. Uh, but man, it's hard to ignore what could potentially be a really nice season for the Colts. Again, I'm kind of thinking that this Colts offense is going to be a version of the Philadelphia Eagles that we've seen the last two, three years. Uh, they have Shane Steichen, the head coach, who basically built that Jalen Hurts, A.J. Brown, Devonta Smith offense with Dallas Goddard in there. And the Colts kind of have that. You know, they have the Jalen Richardson or they have the Jalen Hurts, Anthony Richardson type quarterback. They have a really good running back in JT. And they have a really I like the group of receivers with Pittman, Downs. And then you have Adonai Mitchell and Alec Pierce there. That's a solid core. And then they have like five tight ends. But I think if Richardson stays healthy and he plays 13, 14 games minimum, like easy top five smash. I mean, he was he was rushing the ball way too much for him not to be a top five QB. So I, I think rushing QBs are king in pretty much any format, especially if they're only four point passing touchdowns, you want a, a passing quarterback. If you're playing in a six uh, touchdown league, that's where Stroud, you know, looks better. Burrow, Dak, and, and Love, those guys look better in, in six-point passing touchdown leagues or five-point, whatever. So uh, I really like Richardson. The fact that I get him at 51.5 means he's a fifth-round pick. So if I want to start my draft, you know, say you get the, the, the running back receiver out of the way with the first two picks, you can continue to take a, a running back or receiver in the third round. Or you could grab a tight end in the fourth, which we'll talk about later. Or you could just basically say, I'm going to take my first four picks. I'm going to go, you know, a running back and three receivers or two running backs, two receivers, something like that. 
and just load your nucleus uh, of your flex players there and then grab your QB1 at, at round five. Now, Joe Burrow goes even later. He goes in the sixth round. Dak Prescott, end of the sixth round. If I want to wait till the sixth round, this fully allows you to grab one of those tight ends in the fourth or fifth that give you a top five tight end. And still allows you to grab those, you know, the early running backs and receivers that we talked about, uh, which give you a top five option there. And people forget, man, Dak was the top three quarterback last year. He was playing lights out. They didn't really add anything to the running game. If anything, they downgraded that running. And they're going to continue to, to throw the ball to C.D. Lamb, Jake Ferguson, Brandon Cooks, and we'll see if they can develop some other receivers there. But I think the passing volume is going to be insane in Dallas. And I fully expect them to continue to lean into CD Lamb and let him be the centerpiece of this offense. So I love Dak at his value. And even later, guys, we have Jordan Love, who was a top three quarterback the last half of the season. He's down here at pick 88.1. That's the eighth round. You are allowed seven other picks on your team, which allows you to get the, the tight end, the top five tight end. It allows you to get a ton of depth at running back and receiver, and you can just pluck Jordan Love in the eighth round. I might even move him up into the seventh round, honestly. If I want Jordan Love, I don't mind reaching on him. I love his upside. And then, honestly, the same thing can be said with Kyler Murray. Both these guys, I mean, they're going to run the ball. Jordan Love's going to have some rushing touchdowns and some rushing volume. I've seen a lot of the Packers beat writers talking about Love scrambling and, and, and making some good decisions with the ball in his hands. And then Murray, we obviously know he can run the ball, and this is obviously a really nice setup for him with Marvin Harrison. You got Trey McBride, you have James Conner and Trey Benton in the backfield. You have, you know, whether it's Zay Jones, Michael Wilson, Greg Dorch, I think this might be the best offense that they have given Kyler Murray. So uh, that's kind of the lay of the land for the quarterback. I, I think I'm very excited to draft some of these top guys here. And again, I, I like CJ Stroud, but if it's a four point passing touchdown league, that's where his value is the weakest. If you play in five or six point passing touchdowns, then I'm okay with Stroud. But again, he's just he's just not going to run the football enough here. And if we go back and look at the numbers here, let me just pull it up and kind of show you what we're working with. And I get it. He's, he's set up to smash this year with those players that he's going to be throwing the ball to. Uh, but if we look, last year, CJ Stroud finished his QB9, 167 rushing yards, uh, only three touchdowns. Uh, that's good, though. That's that's very good for him for him to rush as few as he did to get three touchdowns is nice. Uh, but I'm struggling to see him finish as a top. Like, look at the top five QBs last year. All of them over 240 rushing yards, sometimes in the 800s, 500s, 600s. A lot more rushing opportunities, too. Like, Love ran it 50 times. Dak Prescott ran it 55 times. Stroud just doesn't run the ball enough. I think he's more of like a Jared Goff type where, yeah, you can get these 4,500 yards and 30 touchdowns, uh, but it's it's the rushing volume that I think keeps him out of a top five upside season. But we will move into the running backs, and I think this is one of the most important pieces of the draft this year. Consensus top five is CMC, Bijan, Brees Hall, Jonathan Taylor, Jameer Gibbs, and Saquon Barkley. Now, I, I – I know it's consensus top five, but I added a six because if I look at running backs here, McCaffrey, Brees, Bijan, Saquon's at RB4 here on ESPN, which is not good. And then Taylor and Gibbs. Uh, most best ball leagues have Gibbs going as RB4. So that's why I included Gibbs here. And we did note that, you know, if you get a top five running back versus RB10, 11, 12, you're gaining a four points easily. But not every team's going to have one of these top 10, top 12 running backs. So sometimes you're going to start one of these top five guys against, you know, RB16, RB18. There's going to be a lot of teams that are starting some junk even worse at running back. So having a stud running back, I think, is a must this year. And you can have two of these guys. I mean, if you wanted to try starting your draft running back, running back and say, let's go Gibbs and Barkley to start your draft. That's fine. I, I do think you're not going to love your receiver options when it comes back to you in the third, fourth rounds. So I would tread lightly on the RB, RB starts. Unless you're in standard format, I think that's where it might make sense. But uh, anyways, if you, if you get you know a top five pick in a redraft format, you can take CMC. I think I'm still taking CD Lamb. I, I, I like the youth, and I think CD Lamb still has some more meat on the bone. Like his first month last year, he didn't really play his best, and he just lit it up the rest of the year. I think I'm taking CMC number two overall. I'm going to probably consider Bijan or – Jamar Chase at the 3-4 spot, and then I think Brees Hall's right there at the 4-5 spot. So if you have a top five pick and you can't get C.D. Lamb, I think I'm taking a running back. You could maybe argue Jamar Chase or Tyree Kill in there. That's about it. So basically a top six pick guarantees you one of these three running backs. 
And then when it comes back around to you, we'll talk about some of the receivers that you can get. Uh, but uh, I think if you get a top five, six pick, you got to take a running back unless it's CD or one of the other receivers we just mentioned. Now, if you're sitting in the middle to the late end of the first round here, you know, we got Saquon Barkley, Jonathan Taylor, Jameer Gibbs. Um, these guys are probably first round picks in your redraft league, and I'm fine with them. But I'm taking some of the receivers over them, whether it's Justin Jefferson, Amon Ross, St. Brown. Um, you know, Puka Nakua got injured today. Uh, he's going to be probably falling on some of the list, but I still like Puka Nakua quite a bit. Uh, I'm just I'm not taking Barkley in the first round. I, I don't like that value there. But you could if, say you're sitting at pick 10, 11, 12. If you want to grab one of these running backs, because they're probably not coming back, you're going to risk, risk losing these guys, you know, to the people that pick on the 11, 12 turn. But Jonathan Taylor, Jameer Gibbs, those would be my preferences if you're in the back end of the first round and want to get your running back out of the way. Now, uh, if Saquon does come back around to round two, you know, I can see that. And, you know, you go receiver Saquon Barkley to start your draft. I think that's fine. But uh, what has been my preference is if I don't get CMC, Bijan, or Brees, I'm going receiver. And then we're going to draft a running back in the second round off of this list. You know, Kieran Williams, Derrick Henry, Pacheco, ETN, Devon Achan, James Cook, Rashad White. I'm probably going to push Rashad White off this list just because there's some some really good buzz about Bucky Irving. Uh, and, and then I did note here that all have great receiving profiles for PPR league, except for Derrick Henry. If you play in half PPR or standard, I think Henry is a value in full PPR. I'm not touching Derrick Henry. I only see 20, 25 catches on his plate this year. He'd have to, again, rumble for 15 plus touchdowns for him to be even thinking about top five. And he's just getting up there in age. I don't see a receiving workload for him. So he's off my board in full PPR, half PPR standard. It's a play. We'll talk about Kieran Williams and ETN here. They both finished as top five RBs last year and can easily repeat again in 2024. Uh, it might be tougher for Kieran this year with the addition of Blake Corum plus his injury risk, but I really like that Rams offense. And, you know, especially week one, I think they're going to continue to give Kieran the ball 20 times. And then with ETN, they added no competition. They still have second year back Tank Bigsby, who's looking better in camp this year. But I still expect ETN to be the primary receiving back probably the goal line back, probably just out there a ton for snaps. And uh, I like volume. So I can start my draft with AJ Brown and Travis Etienne or say Garrett Wilson and Kieran Williams. I think that's a really nice start. You get your top five upside with those receivers and you can get some top five upside at running back here uh, with these two running backs. Uh, Rashad White was RB6 last year, and the Buccaneers only added a underweight fourth-round pick in Bucky Irving. I might have to change that blurb here because I'm starting to starting to like Bucky Irving and what I'm hearing and seeing out of Tampa Bay. Uh, but I note that White should remain a high uh, – volume should remain high, and if the O-line can open up better lanes, his efficiency may rise. So uh, he's not going to get the volume that he did last year just with Bucky Irving being there, but he caught so many passes last year, and he's a pretty good receiving back uh, where if you have – a full PPR format, Rashad White is your guy. I think in half PPR to standard leagues, he's probably not your guy. Uh, but middle to end of round two, you can grab Rashad White. Say you start your draft with Justin Jefferson, come back with Rashad White. I think that can work. Now, uh, Pacheco is probably my favorite dark horse to finish as a top five running back this year. He's in the high power Chiefs offense. He's got the RB1 spot locked up, and the competition behind him is pretty weak. We're talking Daenerys Prince, Clyde Edwards, Alaire, and a rugby football player. So I fully expect this year to be one of Pacheco's – it might be Pacheco's best year of his career, you know, period. This team is looking really good. The threat to throw the ball is insane this year with the receivers they add. You're going to see a lot of wide-open boxes for Pacheco to, to kind of run wild. And he's a, he's a good receiving back. They trust him to catch the ball and block and do all that and things. So I, I mean, you know, say you're a top-five pick, you go with – you know, whether it's CeeDee Lamb and you come back with Pacheco as your, your round-two pick or you get Jamar Chase – Tyreek Hill, you can get Pacheco easily in round two. And he is he's one of my darlings, I think, this year. I love Pacheco a lot. Now, Devon Achan is one of the few backs that have top five ceiling every week when he's healthy. And if he does see an uptick in volume, he's a smash breakout candidate. The problem is, can he stay healthy? And what's his rushing volume going to be? Is you know Raheem Mostert going to stay healthy? Is Jalen Wright going to eat into some of the workload too? Uh, but I do think we're going to see Devon Achan used a little bit more as a receiver this year, which could boost his PPR floors. I'm I'm all in on Achan, and sometimes his his ADP falls. Um, you know, if I if I look at the top 25 running backs here, 
I mean, Devon Achan is going, where is Mr. Achan? All right, he's actually going right behind ETN. So pick 33.8, which is in the third round. Like you could maybe grab, uh, you can go wide receiver. Say you grab CD Lamb and, you know, maybe Chris Olave to start your draft. You can grab Devon Achan in the early third round. Uh, I do think Achan's probably a late second round value, but he's definitely one of the guys that I like uh, to take my shot at a top five running back. And then the last guy on the list here is James Cook. And we just saw that his ADP is after Achan at 34.3. So, you know, if you like A-Chan, if you like Cook, man, you could grab these guys. And, you know, if you're pick, if you're picking in the top three this year and say you grab your C.D. Lamb, you grab your Chris Olave, Drake London, whatever you want, Nico Collins, and then you can grab James Cook. And I think he's going to be a guy that, you know, we saw last year down the stretch. Buffalo wanted to run the ball more. And with the departure of Diggs and Gabe Davis, I think James Cook is the best player on that offense, not named Josh Allen. I like Kincaid. I like a couple of the receivers there, but James Cook's going to touch the ball more than anybody. And I think in a full PPR league, I think he's a valid candidate for top five upside here. So those are some of the guys that I like at running back to get me a top five play. And once you draft a top five running back, you don't need to draft one for a little bit. We, you know, we, we, we like a lot of the sleeper running backs. And I think I might, you know, I might start working on a, a, a complimentary article here because I'm focusing on top five players at upside. But maybe I start to focus on like um, maybe I do another article where we talk about guys that could crack the top 12 at each position. And that would give you some more uh, some more pieces on your bench. You know, whether these are, you know, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth round picks. Maybe I kind of key in on those rounds and give you guys some more upside uh, on who could be RB2, wide receiver twos, things like that. Um, we'll move into the wide receiver column. The consensus top five wideouts, C.D. Lamb, Tyree Kill, Jamar Chase, Amon Ra, and Justin Jefferson. I shouldn't have to tell you guys to take these players. You guys are all dynamite. They're all fantastic players. Um, their ADPs are all squarely in the top 10. Jefferson's the cheapest he's ever been. Wide receiver five here at 7.6. And then you do see a drop off from 7.6 to wide receiver six, A.J. Brown. So if you have a top, again, a top five, six pick, you're looking at these top three receivers. If you're pick 7, 8, 9, 10, that's where Amon Ra and JJ sometimes fall to you, which I love that value there. Sometimes you might have to just say, yep, I'm going to take A.J. Brown and see what running back comes back to me. You might say, I'm going to take Puka Nakua and see what running back comes back to me. But uh, I, I have no issues taking any of these consensus top five players. You do what you want. You feel you got to feel a draft out. And if you like these RB2s or these RBs in the round two spot, it's just more incentive to take one of these top end wide receivers. So I think to me, the tier is, you know, definitely I'm taking Bijan and Brees probably over Tyree kill. I think I might take Jamar chase over Bijan and Brees, but it's close. Uh, I think that the cutoff is those top three receivers mixed with the top three running backs. Um, but uh, I'm going to, it looks like I didn't make my list here. My, my short list of wide receivers that you want to target in the late first or early second round it's Garrett Wilson, it's A.J. Brown, it's Puka Nakua, and then I think there's a list of guys going outside of the top five that could be top five, and that is Drake London, Devontae Adams, Chris Olave, Marvin Harrison Jr., and Debo Samuel, and then some even deeper guys down here, dark horse top five options, D.K. Metcalf, Nico Collins, Brandon Ayuk, Jalen Waddell, D.J. Moore, Mike Evans. These guys are all round three players that you could target. But uh, we'll talk with uh, Garrett Wilson. He's currently wide receiver eight off the board, 13th overall. We've seen what Rodgers can do for a wide receiver one, whether it's Devontae Adams or Jordan Nelson. You know, it could be really, really sweet for Garrett Wilson. If he approaches north of 160 targets, there's no reason he can't be a top five receiver. You're banking on Rodgers staying healthy and this, this Jets offense continuing to play well. But even if they don't play well, they're still going to be pummeling targets to Garrett Wilson here. So uh, he's the ideal round two wide receiver for me, where if I'm pick 11 or 12, and, you know, if you want to say, yep, I'm going to take Jameer Gibbs here and I'm going to see what receiver comes back around. It might be Garrett Wilson or you could, you know, flip it and say, I'm going to go Garrett Wilson and then I'll take Jonathan Taylor or Saquon Barkley. You can play with that in your mock drafts and see which one you prefer. But absolutely love Garrett Wilson as a top five upside player. A.J. Brown is the next player, wide receiver two in PPR during weeks one through nine last year. And then, of course, the Eagles hit some turbulence. A.J. Brown still finished as a wide receiver five overall. So if they're able to kind of right the ship here and play better consistently throughout the whole year, he's a value at, you know, at being wide receiver seven or eight off the board right now. 
He's ninth in ESPN rankings and is the consensus sixth receiver off the board. He's an ideal start to your draft if you're picking in the back half. I, I love A.J. Brown a lot. I think he's going to be up there in the 1,400-yard range. He's been able to stay healthy the last couple of seasons. He's going to catch 80, 90 passes, maybe even 100 passes, and he's going to flirt with double-digit touchdowns. So, you know, starting A.J. Brown and Kieran Williams, A.J. Brown and Pacheco, like those starts excite me. Now, Puka Nakua got hurt. He's out for at least a week or two. He's going to drop an ADP. I still think, you know, now that he's probably not a first round pick anymore, he's probably an early second round pick. So he pairs nicely with a Jonathan Taylor, Jameer Gibbs start. And if you're looking around and, uh, you know, you like Puka Nakua in the early second, I think I think that's probably the path here. Now, Puka Nakua, we saw it last year. He was wide receiver four. He goes 12th overall in ESPN drafts right now. But that's again, that's probably going to drop. I think Puka is an ideal top five dark horse candidate again this year. You have Cooper Cup getting older, Matthew Stafford still playing good football, uh, but you might get a little discount on Puka right now. So I was saying before he sits at the end of round one, I think he's going to slide a little bit into the round two spot. So if you're 10, 11, 12, you could take Puka first round if you want. Let's get more information on that injury. But uh, ideally, he's paired with a Jonathan Taylor, Jameer Gibbs start for your team this year. Um Moving on to um, the other options that I like quite a bit, you have Drake London, Devontae Adams, Chris Olave, Marvin Harrison Jr., and Debo Samuel. They're all the leading target on their teams, I guess, with Debo kind of being a question. But if Brandon Ayuk is traded, all of a sudden you have something – Sorry about that. Uh, but Drake London, Devontae Adams, Olave, Marvin, and Debo. Now, these guys, we can look at their ADPs over here on ESPN. Devontae, wide receiver, you know, he's going 18th off the board. You have Olave at 21. You have Marvin Harrison Jr. at 22. Uh, and then even further, you have Drake London at 33. You know, there's a lot of players here that are going to be at the end of round two, early round three. And it wouldn't surprise me if any of these guys finished top five. I think especially with Debo Samuel and Brendan Ayuk maybe getting moved, that, that could be a huge win for him. But all these guys are going to be the leading target player on their team. You know, Marvin Harrison, probably 140 targets. Olave over 140. Devontae Adams in the 150s. Drake London, we'll see. I have him in the, like the 130s, 140s. And then again, with Debo Samuel's rushing upside, I mean, I think if you're playing half PPR standard league, Debo is a top five option for you. But this is a really nice list, man. If you if you start your draft with CMC or Bijan or Brees, this is probably who you're looking at at the end of round two. And I like these guys because you can. there's chances where you can get two of these guys. If you're picking second, third, fourth overall, and you got your running back, you know, at the turn, you can go Olave, maybe Marvin Harrison's there round three. Maybe Debo Samuel's there round three. I think if you can get two of these guys, you get two swings at a top five receiver. You're set up already with your top five back. I think it makes a lot of sense. Uh, and then the dark horse options, Metcalf, Collins, Ayuk, Waddle, DJ Moore, Mike Evans. These guys, you know, they're all kind of in the thirties. I, I guess, um, you know, Evans is here at 28 overall. You have Nico at 36. You have Metcalf at 37. Ayuk at 41. He's probably going to dip. Uh, and then Waddle, 45, DJ Moore, 46. Even I should probably add Devonta Smith to this list too, but uh, this is where I'm talking about round three. You're, if you take a quarterback here like Josh Allen, you know, you're missing out on potentially a guy that could be probably top 10, top 12, uh, but with top five upside every week, man, I like this list a lot. So that's why I, I recommend waiting on round three to take your quarterback or your tight end and go wide receiver instead. We could look at some of the running backs here, but I think the value is more so at wide receiver in these round three, sometimes round four. Um, so continue to load up. You got your top five option in the first and second round for running back receiver, but keep loading your plate with really good players because I think I, I just, it feels to me like you can get value at QB and get value at tight end yet. And then we're going to finish up with tight ends here. And in order to get a top five tight end this year, you have to, let me see here. You have to take Kelsey, and he's ranked 19th overall, which is wrong, 23.2 ADP. Laporta goes at the end of round two, which is just seems wrong, his 28 ADP. So these guys are both like, you know, at the end of round two, early round three. 
I'm not taking one of these top five tight ends because I want one of my top five running backs or receivers. So those two are just off my board. Unless they dip hard into the end of the third round, then I will consider them. I recognize they're both likely the favorites to finish as tight end one, but I want more swings at the running back and receiver position. If I go further down the list, you have Mark Andrews, you're at 40. You have Trey McBride at 50. George Kittle, 51, Dalton Kincaid, 54. This is my list that I want to draft tight ends off of because they're in the fourth and sometimes fifth round. Hopefully you already have your one running back and two receivers on the board. Uh, and then, you know, getting Mark Andrews, you can pair him with Lamar Jackson if you want. You can get Trey McBride and Kyler Murray. You can also get George Kittle for pretty easy in the fifth round. And hey, if Brandon Ayuk is traded, like George Kittle's value is going to go up significantly. And then Dalton Kincaid's a nice dark horse pick for a top five tight end option. Now, uh, again, Kincaid goes round five, six, McBride and Kittle into the fifth. And even further down the list here, I have some more guys here. Evan Ingram, who was a top five tight end last year. He goes in the middle of the, the sixth round. Kyle Pitts goes in the sixth and the seventh round sometimes. I really like this value. If I want to wait and evaluate it, you know, in the fifth and sixth round and be like, yeah, I like Trey McBride. I'll pull McBride here. And the way I'm ranking these guys is it's clearly to me, Mark Andrews and McBride should be tight ends three and four. And then I don't take a lot of George Kittle because I, I just – if Ayuk's gone, I'll, I'll change my stance, but I don't take a lot of George Kittle here. I, I think Kincaid's okay as a fifth or sixth round pick. I like him more in the sixth, uh, but I think waiting in the sixth round for Ingram or Pitts gives you a really solid option at a top five tight end. And then even further down the list, I have one more for you. That's David Njoku, who was, I think, the tight end one down the final month and a half of football last year. So he's fantastic. 88.6 is his ADP in the seventh, eighth round insane value there. So I kind of break this all down in the article for you guys. But again, my list of tight end targets is, is probably Mark Andrews, McBride and Kincaid. And if I don't get one of those guys, it's Pitts, Kittle, Ingram and Njoku. So you'll have to play around with that in your mock drafts. And I kind of break these, you know, these tight ends down. Uh, my favorite would be Kyle Pitts. I think he's in for a massive workload last uh, this year. And I know, remember Kirk Cousins' buddy, TJ Hawkinson was tight end one in PPR points from weeks one through 16 and feasted on targets. I think the new Falcons offense is going to be not necessarily a mere version of the Vikings, but I think it's going to be very, very similar. And you're, you're potentially looking at finally the breakout season for Kyle Pitts. I'm going to take my chance on Kyle Pitts in the sixth round because it allows me, you know, my first five picks are running backs, receivers, probably. Round six, I get my tight end. And then round seven, man, I could pull Jordan Love. I could pull a falling Dak Prescott. I could pull a Joe Burrow. I could pull, uh, you know, Kyler Murray. There's a lot of guys in that sixth, seventh round range for tight, uh, for quarterbacks that I like. So that's kind of how I set up my draft strategy. Let me know what you guys think or if you have questions on this. Again, it's free on the fantasyfellowship.com. I'm probably going to post it in the comments and link it in the description for you guys. But I don't know. Draft a top five player at each position. You know, play around with your mock drafts. I think that's the most important thing. You can't just go into your draft without having uh, done at least one or two of them. Try doing, you know, a zero running back or try grabbing an early tight end or quarterback and see how you like your depth. Uh, but for me, again, uh, after doing so many drafts that I've done this summer, top five player in each position is kind of what I'm looking for. And uh, yeah, let me know what you guys think. I can really appreciate any feedback or thoughts you guys have on this list. And uh, yeah, enjoy the article. We'll see you next time. Peace.